Today's lesson, number 11, is holiness and our role. Could I get somebody to turn to 2 Corinthians 7, 1, and someone else for me turn to 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. So that's 2 Corinthians 7, 1, and the second scripture is 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. And hold your thumb on there for a minute. Over the past 10 weeks, we've discussed holiness. And these past two weeks, we've talked about the Spirit's role in making us or transforming us into the image of Christ. Could someone read for me the 2 Corinthians 7.1? Okay. Thank you. And somebody else from me, 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. 1 Peter 1, 1, 15 and 16. Yes, 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Thank you. So yes, folks, we have our role in this. This is not just a mental ascent or a feeling or an intention. We have something to do. In the Wednesday night Romans class, the past few of them that, that Cliff had taught, he is studying in, in Romans 12, 1 and 2. And I'll read that for you. It's, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Cliff spoke of sacrifice and how we are called to give ourselves completely to God. Like the scripture says, as alive, holy, and pleasing to God. So before we continue, let, let's go to our Father in heaven. Most holy, heavenly Father, we give thanks for this day and for this time we have together to worship you and to study your word. Father, as we continue our study in holiness, we ask for your wisdom and discernment as we study our role in achieving holiness. Father, I pray that if I teach anything wrong, that you would defeat me, and not only defeat me, but teach me what is truth, and, and lead us all in the way everlasting. And it's in Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Um, before we go any farther here, um, when I was asked to do this lesson, uh, I, I studied from a, a few different preachers and, and I found a lesson from a preacher out of Oklahoma and I'm sharing that with you. So if anybody has anything to say, I'm not gonna be looking around the room a whole lot. Uh, my name's Ronnie, you can call out, hey brother, uh, hey you with the face, you know, I'll stop and, and, and let y'all uh, chime in there. Other than that, I'm gonna, I'm going to ramble on. This lesson was very powerful to me. So I think you, you guys will um, benefit from it. I'm sure most of you know all this, but it's always good to be reminded as well. So let's talk more about our role in holiness. In Romans chapter 8 and Galatians 5, Paul teaches us to walk by the Spirit, not by the flesh. If we walk by the Spirit, the, the Spirit will produce in us the, the fruit of the Spirit, which is in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. We have to realize and understand that the fruit comes from the Spirit. It is His fruit. It's something that He produces in the Christian. You might think, well, that's evident, of course, but many people make the mistake. They begin to describe in detail the virtues of love, joy, and peace. And then people go home thinking they have some homework to do in achieving these things on their own. 
they were like, oh, these, these are the fruit of the Spirit. I'm going to go home and get me some of this. The attitude being that I'm going to start to produce this love, joy, and peace stuff. And they go about trying to produce this through self-will. As if these things were a diet of some sort. And we all know, <clears throat> and we all need, and excuse me, I'm sorry. I'll calm down here in just a minute. It's been a little while. And all we need is self-discipline in achieving this. And I ask you, how many of us have the discipline to go on something as simple as a diet? We know how this goes. When we want to cut down on the sugar, it seems like every time we turn around, we'll be at a restaurant or a potluck or visiting someone, and there it is. There's the cake and the cookies and ice cream. It's hard to say no. So we'll say, oh, okay, just one cookie or a sliver of cake. And oh, for me, I, I love the ice cream. So we don't say no every time. So just imagine if we can't say no to the ice cream, imagine the type of discipline it takes to produce spiritual fruit. So how does the Holy Spirit produce the fruit of the Spirit in someone? How do the spiritual characteristics become a natural part of our character? This happens in proportion that we submit our will to the will of the Spirit. We submit our will to His will. That's how you produce the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5.16, Paul says to walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So walking by the Spirit or being in the Spirit or submitting to the Spirit? All of these terms are referring to the very same thing. We are living according to the Spirit's will. Now the virtues that Paul describes are the net result of continually submitting our will to the will of the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm not shooting for love. Love is the natural outcome of the thing that I am shooting for. What I am trying to do is submit, the w submit to the will of the Spirit. You see, if I do that, then that love, joy, and peace, that will be the product of that. But I don't try to produce this on my own. I'm trying to submit my will to the will of the Spirit. And if I do that, the fruit will be produced in me. So how is it that we actually do that? How do we submit? to the will of the Spirit. And I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> First, we submit to the Word of the Spirit. God's Word was given to man through the agency of the Holy Spirit, right? What does Peter say? For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. 2 Peter 1.21 it's interesting that the verb here, moved, in the Greek is the imagery of a wind. So it's like a sailboat. I'll, I'll use that imagery. And it's of, a, it's of a, a, a wind pushing the sailboat. So it's like you've got the boat and you've got the sail, but it's the wind that pushes, pushes it from place to place. The comparison here is man has a voice and has an intellect, but it's the Spirit of God that moves some to speak directly from God. So when we submit, excuse me, so when we submit or obey God's Word, we are in effect submitting into the Holy Spirit who gives us that Word. Now submitting to the Holy Spirit requires us to do certain acts. So let's dig deeper. How do I submit to the Word? Well, first, you read it. We read it. We've got to take it in. You, you know, there's, there's quite a few brothers and sisters here that can, can quote directly from the Bible. And... I'll even name me. There, there are some scriptures that I can quote directly from the Bible. And 
it's because I've read that same scripture over and over and over again. So that's where my mind is. That's where my heart is. It's just like when you're listening to the radio and you've got this song on the radio, um, it's your favorite song comes on. You can sing every word um, like that. Uh, Acts 17, 11, what does Luke write? The Bereans were more noble. Why? Because they searched the scriptures daily to see if what Paul and Silas were teaching was so. The gospel was preached to them, and Luke writes that the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians. And again, it was because they were testing the preaching against the scriptures. With this in mind, I would like to challenge us all to be regular Bible readers. And I know life gets in the way. We make our plan to sit down and read the Bible. Um, but let's try to keep that in the forefront of our mind and just commit ourselves every day. Um, I've told myself before, no, I just read Luke a couple of months ago. Well, read it again. Um, another way to submit is thinking and meditating on God's word. Psalm 119, 148, my eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on your word. Have we ever thought about focusing on God's word during our quiet time instead of reviewing past mistakes or worrying about tomorrow's problems? Wouldn't it be better if we just opened the book, look at a verse, try to memorize it, Think about it, focus on it instead of think about what I did in the past, reprimanding myself for it, or worrying what's going to happen in the future if I do this or that. You know those two activities produce nothing. But spending that time meditating on God's Word is quite profitable. Sometimes we wonder what God wants or why we keep making the same mistakes or why we are emotionally or spiritually exhausted at times. Could it be that we rarely allow our minds the opportunity to rest and simply contemplate God's presence by focusing on a portion of His Word? Before I became a Christian, I, I always heard that the King James Version of the Bible was the only accurate one. And everything else was wrong. I tried to read it myself back then, and it left me stumped. Um, I, I just didn't understand it. The language was backwards to me. It, it, and it actually discouraged me, unfortunately. Um, but again, being told it was the only right one, what else do I look at? The reason I bring this up is, is I now believe we should read multiple versions. I believe it can cause some ah, aha moments. And I love the aha moments. They're very encouraging and, and uplifting. So I urge you, take the time to read different versions. It'll keep us fresh and give us the different perspectives. So when we think and meditate on the Word, it is an exercise. It's submission. It takes other things off our minds and directs it towards God. Since He reveals Himself in His Word, the focusing of our thoughts on His Word is to focus on Him and thus lay our hearts open to the Holy Spirit. So turn off your phone, your TV, and go to your private place and direct your mind towards His Word. And you will assume the proper position of humility that constitutes a submissive spirit. And we know this to be because the flesh is in opposition and is reminding us that the yard needs to be cut or the dog needs a bath. The Astros are playing earlier, whatever. I mean, you fill in the blank. The flesh wants to do anything else but focus on God's Word. Another thing we can do to submit to the Holy Spirit is to receive instruction from His Word. Acts 2.42, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The 3,000 were baptized on Pentecost Sunday, they devoted themselves. That Greek word devoted 
I'm going to use the, the sailboat illustration here again. Okay, we're at sea, and there is a terrible storm. The sails are ripped. The boat is being tossed violently, unable to steer. So where are you going to be? For me, I'm going to be holding on to that mast for dear life with my arms and legs wrapped around it. So that word devoted there is a very strong word. The 3,000 new Christians devoted themselves. They hung on, they clung to for dear life to the apostles' teaching. So how can you submit, truly submit to someone if you don't know them? If you don't know what they want? And the only way to truly walk in the Spirit is to know that the way the Spirit walks. And the only way to know this is to know his word. So the grace of God in Christ not only saves me, but it gives me a hunger to do what God wants me to do. And what God wants me to do is submit or walk in the Spirit. And the only way to begin satisfying that hunger and his will is to grow in my understanding of the Spirit's way of living. And that knowledge is acquired in the same way that most knowledge is acquired. And that's through instruction. Anybody here want to be a doctor? Well, from what I understand, we can't go online for $100 and, and buy a diploma. We have to go to college for eight years and study. We, you know, you have to work for it. And that goes for just about anything else you, you want to do in life. You have to learn how to do that work. So what makes us think we don't have to learn how to do the walking of the Spirit? It's the same way. Every time you come to Bible class on Sunday or Wednesday, or a retreat or a seminar, you are expanding your ability to walk by the Spirit. It's no secret that those who are more careful and committed to Bible class as a top priority reap the benefits of a closer walk with the Spirit as an end result. It's not playing favorites. It's like anything else in school. The person that shows up to class and does the homework is going to get a good grade on the exam. And of course, obviously, the way to submit to the Spirit is to do what the Spirit says. Matthew seven twenty one. This is one of those very strong uh, verses from Jesus. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And here it is. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. In this passage, Jesus acknowledges that there will be many who have read and understand and profess to believe the word of the Spirit but they fall short because they don't do it. And that group falls those who know what they should be doing, but for some reason or another, they put it off. For, they put it off for another time and they may think, I should be more involved or I should give up this sin or I should be more faithful or I should be growing in the spirit. But for some, it's always manana, I'll do it tomorrow. True submission doesn't take place unless our will, which is reflected by our actions, not our intentions, is submitted in obedience to the will of the Spirit, which will be reflected by the fruit of the Spirit. This is an iron cast law, a spiritual law, there's no other way to produce the fruit of the Spirit unless you submit to the Spirit. So to go back to our main point, how do we go about submitting or walking by the Spirit? So the first way to do, do it is by submitting to His Word, by reading, meditating on it, learning it, and doing what it says. Now, the next two ways to submit to the Holy Spirit are not so cut and dry, a little more difficult to explain and practice, but we submit to the Spirit when we submit to the power of the Spirit. 
If you look at the Bible as a whole, you will see that each member of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, each member are equal but distinct divine beings in one God. I believe that that the distinction is clearly seen in the role that each plays in accomplishing the salvation of mankind. So if someone says that there are three persons in God, okay, they call it the Trinity, although the word doesn't appear in the Bible, but we refer to it like that. But there are three distinct persons in the Godhead. And you know, it's kind of hard to get our minds wrapped around it. Well, a way to get our minds wrapped around it, that is to understand that we can tell the difference between the three by how they act in the accomplishing of our salvation. That's how we can tell the difference. All of them work in concert, but they are visible to us in different ways in relation to our salvation. And I'll explain in very general terms, we can describe their roles in the following way. The Father. God the Father is the establisher. The world is established by His command. He establishes what is right and wrong, what is permitted and what is forbidden, what is law. We see that, right? I mean, God says you can eat this fruit and you can eat this fruit, but you can't have that fruit over there. The Father is the establisher of the rules. He establishes the terms. He establishes a method and the person who will bring salvation. You see, Jesus didn't choose himself. It says the Father chose him. Jesus, him, Jesus himself says the Father chose me. The Father sent me. The Father establishes the time of the beginning and the time for the end as well as the condition for salvation. That's the Father. In the beginning, it was God the Father who spoke the world into being. And in the end, when all is completed, Jesus will su subject all things back to God the Father. 1 Corinthians fifteen twenty eight. So the Father is the establisher. The Son is the embodiment. The Father willed the world and the Son embodied that will in the command to bring forth the universe and mankind. And after man fell into sin, the Father promised a Redeemer, and the Redeemer was embodied in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Son embodies the perfect will of God the Father, whether He does so in the form of His Word, in the form of His Son, in the form of His Church, or in the form of His heavenly kingdom. Paul says that he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the embodiment, Colossians 1.17. So every perfect thing established by the Father has its perfect essential form in Christ. For example, we see the universe, but the Son is the essence of God's will that established the universe. We see the prophecies and the law and the gospel, but the Son is the essence of God's will in speaking it. We see Jesus of Nazareth, but the Son is the essence of God's will in the sending of the Messiah. We see the church, but the Son is the essence of God's will in establishing an earthly kingdom called the church. We see the promises of heaven after death, but the Son is the essence of God's will for the consummation of the ages in eternity. He holds everything together. And so the Son is God's link to the human dimension. We see Him in and through and over everything that exists. God sees the Son. So we have the establisher, the Father, the embodiment, the essence of the Son, and we have the enabler, the Holy Spirit. 
when the world was established by the Father through the embodiment of his word in the Son, it was the Holy Spirit that the Bible says moved or hovered over the void. And that Hebrew word there, hovered, means to vibrate. The Spirit was over the void, kind of like sound waves, like when you studied them in school. The Holy Spirit vibrated over the void. The Holy Spirit translated God's word and command into the physical action that brought forth the creation. And it is he that sustains the universe. This idea that man says, if we don't stop, we'll destroy the earth. Man does not have the power to destroy the earth because he does not have the authority to destroy the earth. Obviously, though, we have a responsibility to be good stewards of the earth, to care for the earth, of course. And in that sense, I agree, we should maintain a clean environment. But even if all the men in the world got together and decided that they would destroy the earth, they couldn't do it. Why? Because the Holy Spirit sustains creation. It is through the work of the Spirit that God's specific will embodied in His Word is actually carried out. You know, when we speak of the providence of God, we are talking about the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you may hear someone use the phrase, it was a God thing, but what we were really saying is the Holy Spirit was at work, or the providence of God was at work. Miracles are carried out by the Spirit's power. Prophets speak according to His leading. Mary became pregnant by His agency. Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that same Holy Spirit will also raise us from the dead. Isn't it what Paul says in Romans, if the Spirit in you is the same Spirit who raised Christ from the dead, that same Spirit will raise up you up also? You know, in Acts 2.38, the idea has been blown off at times, I guess. It's like, well, you know, <clears throat> repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so as Christians, we say, okay, I have the gift of the Holy Spirit. He dwells in me. So what now? I don't feel anything. I'm out of the water. I was baptized last year. What's he going to do for me? Well, what he's going to do for you, for me, is going to raise us from the dead. It is the Holy Spirit that bestows gifts on the church and comforts the saints when in need. In Romans 8.28, Paul says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. This can be one of those verses that can be easily mangled, not by Paul, of course, but by us at times, because we take this verse to mean that if, if we win at a game, we'll say, well, God was on our side. See, things worked out for our good. Or maybe we got a good deal in a car and we'll say, see, God was on our side. In other words, when something good happens to us, it's because God is working out things for our good. And while I don't say no to the fact that God blesses us with good things in our life, but in this passage, the good he's talking about is the salvation of souls. Everything works to the good of saving your soul. The Holy Spirit works all things together for what purpose? For your ultimate good so that you will come face to face with the gospel and hopefully obey the gospel. That's the good. What good is it if we have 10 cars and 15 houses but lose our souls? So the good here is the salvation and preservation of our souls. Everything is working for that purpose, to keep us saved, to get us saved, and to keep us saved. 
God works in our lives with the purpose of bringing us to Christ and maintaining our faith and spreading that faith. In Acts 16, 6 and 7, we read that Paul wanted to go to Asia to preach. He wanted to go east, but the Spirit prevented him. Why? I don't know. Oh, the Bible doesn't say why he made him go west, not east. Um, maybe there was road construction. <laughs> but what I do know is it was God's will. Um, that That's the direction he sent him for his, the gospel to spread. And it did. The Spirit wanted Paul to go west, not east, because this was in line with his plan for good. The Holy Spirit works events and forces in this world to pursue his goal of spreading the gospel and protecting the church and preparing for the return of Christ. And when I hear that, I was just think, what a wonderful day that day will be. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. All things work for that good. So this means we should be sensitive to the circumstances of our lives. There are two powers at work here. And we know one of them is the influence of Satan and the other is the power of the Holy Spirit. And we can tell the difference when we observe the direction of the events and opportunities and circumstances in our lives. Which way are they moving us? Is it really a God thing if you hit the jackpot somewhere? Thinking, oh wow, this must be a God thing. I got $100,000. I guess it depends on what we do with it, but should we be playing the jackpot? I guess that's another lesson. If the circumstances work together to lead us further into the world, further from Christ, further from the church, believe me, they are not from God. But if they open doors for new opportunities for service, for growth, for knowledge, then you can know that the Holy Spirit is working for good in your life. So submit to the working of the Spirit in your life, and the product of the Spirit will be seen in you. Okay, a final way to walk in the Spirit. We said to submit to the Spirit's Word, then submit to the Spirit's power. And the third thing is submit to the discipline of the Spirit. Let's read Hebrews 12, 4 and 5. Hebrews 12, 4 and 5. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. And you have, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. So the third way to walk by the Spirit is submit to the discipline of the Spirit. God disciplines us through the work of the Holy Spirit in engineering these things for our good. It could be through various trials we suffer according to James Chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. It could be through the correction of the church in some way. Maybe someone is, is not living as we should, and the church will lovingly discipline them. It could be through a period of spiritual dryness that we encounter. You know, Jesus was in the desert. It could be the overwhelming amount of discouragement in ministry. You know, Paul was encouraged by the Lord as he stood trial before the Jews. I'm not saying that God creates bad things and sends the Holy Spirit to put them in our lives. God does not sin, nor does he tempt anyone to sin, nor does he draw anyone towards evil. But through the Holy Spirit, he does allow us to suffer trials and setbacks and discouragements and sorrows in order to teach us and strengthen us. The Holy Spirit is the one who sees us through these things. 
He is the one who mentors our progress, comforts our anxiety and doubts. He ever brings our groanings and supplications to heaven in prayer before God. And some people, they fight him, refuse to acknowledge him. They refuse to accept the situation they're in, saying, oh, it's no problem. But they'll continually cry out for relief instead of insight. When we go through a difficult moment in our lives, it is natural to cry out for relief. And that, that's okay. That's natural to do that. But it's also okay to cry out for insight, asking God, what are you telling me, Lord? What can I learn, Lord? So when we do submit to the discipline of God administered by the Holy Spirit, we find ourselves more in line with the Spirit's will and purpose for our lives. And we begin producing what Paul talks about in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And so to summarize, um, before we talk about the nature of the fruit that comes from the walking in the Spirit, we must first identify what walking in the Spirit consists of. If we know how to walk in the Spirit, then the product of that experience will come forth freely because we cannot produce spiritual fruit through human wisdom or will. I have said that to the degree that you walk in the Spirit, you will produce the fruit of the Spirit. We walk in or by the Spirit in three ways. Quick review. By submitting to the Word, we read, we think, we do what the Spirit says. Two, we submit to the power of the Spirit. In other words, we allow the Spirit to guide our way. And number three, we submit to the discipline of the Spirit. We subject ourselves to His correction and his building up. You know, maybe a lot of people are not fully aware of what a great thing is taking place in the waters of baptism. The Jews, they were familiar with baptism and it's purifying as a purifying symbol. So a baptism to remove sins was not a new idea for them. The priests, the Levites had to purify themselves with water. And there were even several purification rites with water. So they got the connection with water symbolically and spiritual cleansing. So when Peter got up on Pentecost and said, repent and be baptized for forgiveness of your sins, that made perfect sense to them. They understood the connection between the two. But that each of them would personally receive the Holy Spirit, that was news. This was fantastic because the blessing had only been reserved for the prophets, kings, and judges. But now the promise, the promise that when the Messiah comes, everyone will have the Spirit, old and young, rich and poor. Everyone will have the Spirit, and not just for a time, but everyone will have the Spirit living in them permanently. Praise God. So as it was then, it is now. Those who are baptized into Christ will receive forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so with the Spirit's power in our Christian lives, we will grow into the knowledge of God's Word. We understand God's will for our lives and God's way for us to walk before Him. And if we submit to Him in these things, he will produce the fruit of the Spirit as a result. Thank you. For those of us here today that are, <clears throat> that are here today and those that are listening, I hope that you've been encouraged by this lesson to walk by the Spirit. This is our part, to put it into practice what we've learned. Um, this study has had a huge impact on the way I think and brought me closer to God. I, I spent about three weeks with it and I, maybe you can't tell, I don't know. But <laughs> uh, Anyway, if you are not yet a Christian and you want to learn more about becoming a Christian, come see me or one of the elders or one of the members here. 
we are always ready to help. And if you've already decided to become a Christian or ready to enter into covenant with God through the waters of baptism, come forward now. The water's ready. Thank you very much, folks. Y'all have a great day.